understand the some of you saw the film all of you saw the film who's seen the film okay it's about half of you all right those of you who've seen the film forget it because <laughs> because i mean the film is great i love the film but it's not the novel and years ago some of you will know meg wallitzer from her time out here i imagine and many years ago before i really knew meg in fact i think the first time i ever met meg I asked her what it had been like to have one of her novels uh, adapted. She wrote a novel called This Is This Is Your Life, which was about two sisters, one fat, one thin. It was made into a film by Nora Ephron called This Is My Life, which was about a comedian. <laughs> and I, ha I had really loved the book, and I thought the, the film was charming, but it just seemed to me a completely different animal. and I. I said to her, what, what was that like? And she said, she sort of took this deep cleansing breath <laughs> with a kind of hard one zen, and she said, it was a variation on a theme. And I kept coming back to that um, this past year. Um, certainly the first time I read the script, which was a kind of out-of-body experience, and then um, on the set, and then seeing the final film. And it really is a variation on a theme. But this... This is the theme that we're gonna, that we're dealing with tonight, and I'm very happy to be reading to you from admission. I thought I might read from the new book, but since you guys have been have seen the film, I I, I guess I'll. Besides, there's not much more time that I can read from this book because in a few months it's all going to be this one, which is by the way this just came, so you guys are like the first ones to see this. It's nice, isn't it? <laughs> and what's nice is you can't see it now because they've got all this sales stuff on the back, but there's a closed eye on the cover, and on the back there's an open eye. Oh. <laughs> anyway, um, admission is, uh, it's about an admissions officer at Princeton whose name is Portia Nathan. Try not to see Tina Fey when I make this description. <laughs> um, I mean, you can if you want. She's, she's not bad to look at. But um, I'd been interested in, in college admissions, I think, since I went through it myself back in the late 70s. And uh, it, was, it was a nightmare then, and now it's a double, triple, quadruple nightmare. And if any of you are parents, you, you don't have to take my word for that. You know that that's true. And actually, those of you who are students who have just gone through this yourself, you know um, how absolutely dreadful and horrible this process is. And there are, there are enough reasons for that that it would take much more time than I have to read, so I won't. I mean, I wrote a 400-page novel about that, but um, I had always been fascinated by how these decisions get made, and as a faculty spouse at Princeton, I kind of had a front row seat to uh, at least one generation of my husband's students who were wonderful. They were smart. They were articulate. They were interesting, but they weren't the only smart, articulate, and interesting young people out there, and I didn't I was very interested in the process by which a class was put together, so I went to the Dean of Admissions and I said, will you hire me as an outside reader? And she did. She may regret that now, but she did. <laughs> and, uh, and I was, uh, you know, I, I worked for her for two years as what they call an outside reader. Um, basically, we were trained to read applications and uh, write them up, and we weren't part of the decision-making. Well, we were part of the decision-making process in, in that our our write-ups were used by the admissions officers, but we weren't there in the room at the end of the admission season making the decisions. So um, I started writing the novel uh, towards the end of my first year there as the complexities and the pressures of the job began to help me form the character of Portia. And right from the start, I knew that I wanted to look at the double meaning of the word admission as being something that we let in, but also something that we let out. And uh, she really became uh, a more compelling character to me as I began to think about what kind of person chooses this kind of work and why she would stay for as long as this, this woman stays. And it was clear to me right away that she was avoiding something in her own life. And it was people don't often believe this but you don't know these things when you start you know them as you go along and when I began to realize what Portia's um, issue was I got you know very excited about where the book was going anyway this excerpt um, I, I'm old now so I need to wear my glasses um, 
takes place in the middle of the novel, and it's, it's uh, from a chapter called Inside the Box. And Portia has just come back from a disastrous visit to her mother. Uh, her long-term relationship has just ended, and her, her life is beginning to uh, come apart. But the one thing that's a refuge for her now, as always, is her work. So it makes perfect sense to her that she should leave home in the middle of the night to go to her office and, and go to work. And that's what she's doing. And as she's doing it, she ruminates uh, a bit on the absurdity and the craziness of college admissions. Portia hauled her bags of folders through the Fitz Randolph Gate, Nassau Hall, Princeton University's nerve center, and for a few heady months in 1777, home to the infant US government, looked majestic in the failing light with its great preening tigers and fluttering ivy, and behind it the campus unfurled stalwart buildings lined by deserted, linked by deserted walkways. It's not a lot of light up here. There's no way to get any more, is there? Sorry. Okay. Oh, great. <laughs> With its great preening tigers and fluttering ivy, and behind it the campus unfurled, stalwart buildings linked by deserted walkways. Looking up at West College, she saw no lights at all. Not Clarence's corner office. He and his partner were in New Haven with friends. Not Dylan's visiting his parents in Houston. Not Corinne's with the kids on some island. That she was here after nightfall was not in itself unusual. In January, February, and March, as the intense period of reading gave way to the still more intense period of committee meetings, all of them frequently worked late into the night, percolating along in a fittingly collegial rhythm. She had sometimes certainly been the last one out the door, intent on making it through Western Oregon or the Archbishop Midi School or the imperious baseball coach's most urgent request before allowing herself to head for home. But coming in like this, alone in the darkness to an empty building, in all these years it was a first. The unbroken line of dark windows was definitely disconcerting, but at the same time she felt some relief. There would be no one up there to question her. She opened the door with her own key and went first to the administrative warren at the back of the building, passing the abandoned receptionist's desk. She turned on the lights as she went, bathing the nondescript corridor in harsh <laughs> fluorescent illumination that picked up every ding and mark on the walls, passing the silent photocopier in its alcove. Against one wall, two of the fax machines were lit and humming, neatly depositing pages and pages into their trays. In the cubicles, screensavers pulsed and danced. The smorgasbord of ill-judged baked goods, these are cookies and brownies that uh, applicants send in, that they have the, on one particular table. The smorgasbord of ill-judged baked goods had been cleared away, only a spattering of crumbs left behind. On Martha's desk, a phone purred forlornly five times, six times, then went silent. It was all, in fact, very silent. She hoisted her bags onto the counter below the staff mailboxes and began to lift out handfuls of files. There were a few she'd flagged to remove at this point, and she went hunting for them now, quickly locating the fluorescent pink post-it notes on their covers. These were folders she had questions about for one reason or another, small items she might already have dealt with if Susanna, Susanna's her mother, were not such a Luddite who refused to own a computer. Because she was, however, and because she did not, and because Portia had declined to drive into Hanover to undertake this sensitive business on some public terminal in Baker Library, she had merely flagged the files to come back to. One of these was a boy from a private day school near Boston, whose guidance counselor, a woman Portia had met when she'd visited the school last spring, had declined to answer two notable questions on the secondary school report. Has the applicant ever been found responsible for a disciplinary violation at your school, whether related to academic misconduct or behavioral misconduct that resulted in the applicant's probation, suspension, removal, dismissal, or expulsion? Has the applicant ever been convicted of a misdemeanor, felony, or other crime? Almost always the answer to these questions was no. Sometimes it was yes, and sometimes that was not in itself the kiss of death. There were kids who'd made mistakes and grown from them, there were victims of excessive zero-tolerance school rules, suspended for carrying a loaded water pistol or pointing a finger and declaring bang. There was even the occasional Jean Valjean crime of necessity. She had never forgotten the boy from Oregon who had shoplifted liver for his family. Liver, if only he had been a stronger student. 
but she could not remember a single instance in which the guidance counselor had declined to answer the questions. It could, of course, be an oversight, a typo, but at this school, with tuition upward of 25 grand a year and a student parking lot crowded with Lexus coupes and BMWs, Portia suspected not. Another worrying application was from a Rhode Island girl whose complex, mellifluous essay was somewhat at odds with her low English grades and poor score on the writing section of the SAT. Not to mention the fact that her favorite book listed in the few details section was Pride and Privilege <laughs> by Jane Austen. That's A-U-S-T-I-N. Portia accordingly wanted to check the girl's tribute to Fannie Lou Hamer against their data bank of essays for sale. Of course, the Rhode Island girl might simply have risen to the challenge of her essay, taking her time, thinking through her points, and checking her sentences carefully to avoid grammatical errors. But there was something in the ease of the language that worried Portia. Correctness, after all, was achievable with sweat. But in her experience, it was nearly impossible to drill grace into prose. Remember that, writing students. <laughs> there was also a boy from Boston Latin who had furnished a list of Princeton philosophers he wanted to work with and an essay of such dense philosophical prose that Portia had had no idea what he was talking about. In fact, she could have sworn when she'd read it at Susanna's kitchen table days earlier that it had something to do with zombies. What next, she'd thought, mummies and vampires? She had decided to send the essay to David, David is her philosopher friend, and ask him to sort it out. Philosophers seem to have a knack for recognizing their own kind as well as the imposters in their midst. <laughs> Finally, there was the Connecticut boy whose long list of school government offices, dramatic roles, community service projects, and baseball position had ended with the words national judo champion. It might, of course, be true, but in Porsche's previous dealings with bona fide national judo champions, and not a few had indeed applied to Princeton, this accomplishment did tend to be noted in recommendations and to require enough practice time to preclude student government drama and varsity baseball. <laughs> national judo champions also had a tendency to write about being national judo champions. They solicited their coaches for references and supplied newspaper reports attesting to the fact that they were well, national judo champions. <laughs> it would easily be settled by Google, Portia thought, finding the file at the very bottom of the stack and setting it aside. Why anyone would bother to lie in the age of Google was baffling. We are trusting skeptics, her first dean of admissions had told her years before. We believe what they tell us, but they'd better be telling us the truth. This was Harold McHenry, the soon-to-be former dean of admissions at Dartmouth, who had hauled her aboard her profession, in the, hauled her aboard the profession in the spring of her final Dartmouth year. Harold's sense of fair play, fair play he sweetly assumed everyone else likewise embraced, had been one of his most endearing qualities. He had a horror of the so-called new rules of admissions, the outsmarting and end runs and decoding now rampant out there, the snake oil salesman promising to package and sell your kit to his or her school of choice. For as long as he could and longer, perhaps, than he should have, Harold stubbornly regarded each application as an open, invigorating conversation between his staff and the applicant, in which there could be no dissembling on either side. He expected total candor from each applicant and maintained that expectation even after little wildfires of, so of scandal broke through the industry in the 1990s, kids getting other kids to take their SATs for them, applicants who wrote their own recommendations, people pretending to be Rothschilds and ranch hands. These events had been personally wounding to Harold, but he had stayed the course, doing his best to ride the new waves, trying to maintain his personal honor code. There was something a little haunting about this terribly ordinary room, Portia decided. She tried for a moment to see it not as the generic office it absolutely was, but as the epicenter of so much fervent speculation by students, teachers, counselors, and parents. To them, this utilitarian space was the holding pen where their child and all his or her antagonists were gathered, vetted, directed, shunted into narrower and narrower corridors leading to smaller and smaller vestibules, where they were commanded to wait in mute distress, face to face with their most closely matched fellow aspirants. Wrestlers here, legacies there. Pakistanis to the right, woodwinds, novelists, witheringly brilliant mathematicians, faculty kids, staff kids, movie star kids, movie stars, ordinary decent kids, good debaters, great debaters, boys who wanted to be Brian Green, girls who wanted to be Stephen Sondheim or Meg Whitman or Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> there was, for instance, one tiny chamber in which the diver from Wisconsin sat knee to bandage knee with the diver from Maine. 
the lounge where the girls from MIT's women's technology program were briefly uncomfortably reunited, the claustrophobic cubicle where the classically trained soprano from Florida eyed the classically trained soprano from Los Angeles and the classically trained soprano from Cleveland. That it didn't actually work like this was not even relevant because Portia understood the symbolic power of this place banal as it was. That power was even greater, she suspected, than the symbolic power of their individual offices upstairs, the conference room, even Clarence's comfortable lair with its non-working fireplace. She had been inside the machine for so long that she sometimes forgot how this, this applying to college thing had looked from the outside, but it did come back, vividly back, when she tried to remember. It had been like watching a mass of seemingly identical sheep cram themselves into a great black building with no windows, knocking against one another, stepping on one another's hooves and over their panicked bodies when they fell. At the other end of the building, only a thin line of sheep trickled out into bountiful fields. And what was it about those sheep, which looked to all intents and purposes exactly like every sheep who had crowded in? What made them special? Why should they get the meadow when those others were barred? What happened inside that box was a mystery, a secret shielded from the light. She remembered how the class ahead of her in high school had been sorted, with the most cerebral Latin geek shut out from every college he'd applied to while the class's drug dealer of choice had his pick of Harvard and Brown. How the valedictorian, who was also the student body president, retreated in humiliation to his safety school while the dullest dishwater football player trotted off to Cornell. Who were these people in the admissions offices of Swarthmore and Williams, and what could they have been thinking when they accepted Camilla Weldon, Portia's soccer teammate and the most superficial girl she had ever met, but passed over Jordana Miles, who wrote her own column in the school newspaper and had actually published three short articles in 17. But there was perhaps no mystery as baffling as that of her own admission to Dartmouth. She had been a worried high school senior, lacking in, well, anything special, really. A pretty good student, pretty good soccer player, pretty good writer, an all-around nice person, Portia knew exactly what would happen to her own college application if it arrived through some warp of time and space in this room today. With her strong GPA and merely quite good scores, busy athletic schedule and character building volunteer efforts, Portia Nathan's application would have landed in the great moving tide of similar applications. Great kids, smart kids, hardworking kids, who would certainly do great at whatever college they ended up going to, which almost certainly wasn't going to be Princeton. The secret of her own mediocrity was quite likely similarly held by men and women all over the industry. To wade through these best and brightest 17-year-olds was to be at once deeply reassured by the goodness and potential of the American near adult population and deeply humbled by one's own relative shortcomings. These students were absolutely going to make scientific discoveries, solve human problems, produce important works of art and scholarship, and generally, as so many of them pointed out, give back to their communities and make the world a better place. She, on the other hand, was fit only to make life-altering decisions on their behalf. And how could that make sense? So I'll stop that. I, I brought a little something to read at the end, but I wanted to, I'm going to pretend there isn't a plant in the audience who's going to ask me a question now. <laughs> Tess, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> <Okay>. uh, <laughs> Um, with that, how do you rediscover how to write novels when beginning new projects? It's it's terrifying. I mean, they talk about the blank page, but when you're re when you're writing novels, it's 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 a blank page on steroids because you know that it could be nothing or it could be the first step of a three year commitment. Um, I, I find that every time I finish a novel, I have to. I have to not write for a long time. And I used to really beat myself up about that not writing and feel that everybody else was home scribbling away and writing the great American novels. We were sort of talking about that before. Um, but whenever I tried to, to, to kind of make myself more productive after I'd finished a long novel, I always ended up throwing it out and feeling terrible and then having to wait even longer. So I've learned that you know this, there, there is an important fallow period for me where I, I I really have to let the ideas come again um, and and it hasn't always been starting from zero because 
se several of the novels that I've written had very, very long gestations. In some cases, I was thinking about the idea for 20 years. Um, but you have to be brave. I mean, you can't be a, you can't be a shrinking flower and decide that, oh, I'm going to write a 400-page novel now. You have to be incredibly brave, and you have to be, you have to be ready to fail. You know, that's, you, you, we hear that a lot, the importance of failure. Um, but it, it does take a certain bravery, and I guess maybe I'm not that naturally brave a person. I have to wait for that to sort of build up, too. But, um, but I'm right in the middle of my enforced period of not writing right now, and I have zero ideas what I'm going to write next. So <laughs> I'm, I'm saying it, and I'm really hoping that it's true, because I, I would like to write another novel now. <laughs> so I did not answer your question. I hope it did. Do you want some of us to maybe make suggestions? About what to write next? <laughs> it's, never it's never worked. Well, I mean, I'm sometimes just... it's a really good idea, but, but not for me. It's usually a really good idea for the person who's making the suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> What's your suggestion? No, uh, I wouldn't want uh, You know, it's usually something that's been bugging you for years. Like uh, my novel, The White Rose, which is very special to me, it's, it's completely non-autobiographical, but it's a very personal book. It's um, a resetting of the Strauss opera, De Rosen Cavalier which if any of you are opera people, you know that it, The Rosen Cavalier is set in Vienna in the 18th century, and it's about all these aristocrats running around having affairs with one another. Um, I love this opera so much, uh, and it took me 20 years to realize why I loved it so much. And then when I wrote my version of it, it was set in New York in the 1990s, and everybody was Jewish. So, you know, and maybe it took me that 20 years to figure out why I cared and what I was going to do with it. So, and then another novel, The Sabbath Day River, is, is, has another template. It's about, um, it's about the Scarlet Letter, um, but it's also about this weird crime that took place in Ireland when I used to live there. So it takes time for these things to sort of bubble up to the surface and then meet each other and get married. And so that, that's what I think, anyway. Sorry, was, yeah, you had a question? process of entering the process again in every book is different in terms of the process, as well as the characters when you're working with them and developing them, what they develop through you. So if this particular book, what, do you have any feelings about what you've learned or what changed within you as yeah. you did this? I, I, yeah. I think a lot of it had to do with the character of Portia. Portia, like virtually every other woman I've ever put at the center of a novel, is at least in part very unlikable. I mean, she's a very, um, she's a very repressed person. She's very closed off, and she's terrified. She's terrified of a lot of things. And to kind of break her open and watch her uh, ha have to confront the things that have made her the woman that she is was very moving to me. And you know, I had to. There's a point later in the in the novel when she's she can't even get out of bed. I mean, she's just absolutely destroyed by uh, by having finally understood what she has done to herself and to the people around her. Um, and that was uh, that was a very powerful experience for me. Um, and I went straight into doing it to another woman. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I I think I said in the interview that I, that I did for. Um, for out for the paper out here that I don't think I've ever written um, a, ca a female character who I didn't want to slap at some point. <laughs> and uh, Portia is very much somebody who, uh, you know, if I met her at a party, I would say, no, you know, it's not, it's not for me. But but I would be wrong because she's a fascinating person inside. So what did I learn? I, I guess I guess I learned that to me some of the m most interesting people are the ones who are terribly off-putting and easy to dismiss. And they're interesting to me. I mean, I love a likable heroine as much as any other reader. Um, but you know, my favorite heroine of all time is, is Elizabeth Bennet, and she's not very nice either. So, um, so maybe there's something. I'll, I'll leave the really nice women to other writers, I guess. I'll just keep writing about unpleasant women. <laughs> any other questions? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, you 
published in multiple genres, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the experience of that, and does it seem like, is it is it hard to avoid being pigeonholed? Oh my God, what a good question. Uh, okay, you have to stop me if I go on too long about this. Um, I am incredibly grateful for having started as a poet, and I know there are poets in this room, so I'm going to say this especially for you. Um, being, being a poet teaches you to respect language in a way that I don't, I don't even know that starting out as a fiction writer will do this for you, but being a poet will. And you know, my, my hope when I was uh, young was that I would be a poet only, but I think that's because I was really terrified to write fiction. I was really terrified to make things up. And I quickly discovered that as a poet, I had only one subject, and that was me. And I got really tired of writing about myself, and I'm sure that my readers, if they had existed, would also <laughs> have gotten really tired of reading about me. Um, but when I finally was brave enough to, to try fiction, um, I discovered that I could not leave a sentence alone if it wasn't, if it didn't rise to my idea of what a, a sentence in a poem would be. And I don't know that I always achieved that. I'm not, I'm not saying that every word is poetry that I've written, but if it's an ugly sentence, I can't leave it there. I have to, I have to make it as beautiful as I can. And that, that means sounding beautiful. And again, that doesn't mean sounding mellifluous and flowery and butterflies and all that. It has to sound good in my ear. If it's ugly, I have to, I can't go on to the next sentence. And that's something I definitely learned as a poet. And I'm incredibly grateful for that. Um, as far as the genre thing, <laughs> when I did get brave enough to write fiction, I wrote two novels that were, were not published. They were rejected by everybody on the planet. And that was a really low point for me. That was a very, very unhappy time. And when I um, decided that I would try another book, I made a very uh, kind of cut and dry decision that I would now write a book that somebody would publish. That was really important to me. And, um, and I wrote this legal thriller with very nice sentences. But <laughs> I wrote the legal thriller. And then I had another problem. And the other problem was now I was a legal thriller writer. And the publisher wanted me to write a sequel right away. And uh, I found that I had, and this says more about the literary world, I think, than it does about me, but I found that I had taken myself out of the literary world, of the, of the world of high art. And I have never, ever been uh, readmitted to that world. And that, it's meant less to me as I've gotten older and hopefully more mature, but it is absolutely true that, um, that I kind of put a, you know, I mentioned the Scarlet Letter before I, um, uh, genre, the G for genre is on my head, even though I, I think of myself as a literary writer. But what I did learn from, from writing that legal thriller was that I had always loved plot, and I had always loved a great story that took me away, and that perhaps my love for beautiful sentences on the page only went so far that in a novel where nothing happened except there were beautiful sentences on the page. I was not a happy reader, and I learned that I would not be a happy writer either. So as I laboriously took myself out of the uh, of the suspense, mystery, legal thriller, whatever you want to call it, genre, um, I really I had to claw my way out. But I never completely left it behind because plot matters to me. And actually, this book, which is now so bizarre, is going to be marketed as a thriller again, which I'll oh, forget it. I'm done. I mean, I can't, <laughs> I can't even care about it anymore. I feel like my job is to write the book. And if they want to call it whatever they want to call it, I'm, I'm not. I'm, listen, I'm thrilled I'm, I'm published. And I'm, I'm thrilled that I have readers, finally. It's, it's a huge, huge thing for me. So that wasn't a very happy answer to that question, was it? But, but I, I do think it meant. It matters. I mean, this is why people make up pseudonyms if they want to if they want to write mysteries on the side or if they want to publish poetry or something. You will find it very, you know, people get one idea in their head about who you are and what you do, and it's very hard to get out of that. So, yeah, a bit of a cautionary tale for that. I'm sorry to say. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit about your drafting and revision? Yeah, I tend to get all the way to the end before I start revising. Um, 
I mainly because the hardest part for me is getting there, is getting to the end, and I'm a good fixer. Uh, I'm better at fixing it than making it up in the first place. So I usually have a long, kind of flabby, <laughs> um, unkempt draft, and then I show it to my best friend, who's a writer also, and her name is Deborah Michelle. She just published her first novel. I'm happy for her. Uh, and um, she is very, very good at sort of reaching into all of this flabbiness and saying, this is where it goes wrong. And this, this character doesn't belong here. I never believed this. And um, I let it sit for a while. I listen to her and I listen to my agent. And then I go back and I generally um, do big structural things. And there are usually three or four drafts, but that first one is, is the real heavy lifting. And so that's the three year draft? Yeah, well, usually the first draft is a year and a half to two years, and then there's another, another year of tinkering. Actually, just as I was waiting at the end for Kathy to pick me up, I was doing final corrections for this book. So it's still going on. It's like, <laughs> I mean, you want to catch them all, but. The, the fixes get tinier and tinier as the as the process goes on, but yeah, and then if you're really, really lucky, you have a good copy editor who says things like, you know, you said her daughter was eight years old, and now you're saying she's nine years old, which is it? So, because the more you change things, you you can let these little things go, and, and uh, that's embarrassing, so. But I, I have abandoned books in, in the middle of a first draft because I knew that no matter what I did, um, it wasn't going to work. That's, that's another reason that I, I learned to wait. I learned to wait until the, the sort of pressure per inch of not writing is harder, even harder than the writing, and the writing is hard. So it has to be really hard where you know you have an idea, and if you don't sit down today and write that first sentence, you're an idiot. That's when you start. <laughs> I make it sound so jolly, don't I? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I, um, in the vein of you talking about the type of character that you write and how you write these characters with people that you don't like and you just like slap them. Yeah. I had a conversation with a friend of mine about uh, protecting how we protect our characters too much or not enough. Yeah. I don't really think of them in terms of believable. I mean, all you have to do is look at how people behave in the real world, and you see that believable is such a vast, you know, <laughs> look at reality TV. If you wrote one of those characters, you would say, come on, who would behave this way? But, so I guess believability, I don't, I don't really think about that much. Likeability, I used to worry about a lot more than I do now. Maybe, again, because I'm older and I'm crankier than I used to be. Um, <laughs> But, you know, and there's one, I don't know, is Dawn here who wrote the article? No, okay, I can say this then, okay. Dawn made one tiny little mistake in the article that she, uh, she wrote for the newspaper. Uh, we had been talking about this thing <laughs> about the Rocky Horror Show. You all know the Rocky Horror Show, right? So there is this line in the Rocky Horror Show where, um, uh, forgive me if, if you don't know the Rocky Horror Show, I'm just <laughs> going to do this very fast, but Rocky is this gorgeous, muscular guy who has just been created by the evil Dr. Frankenfurter for his personal enjoyment, and he shows him to his guest, Susan Sarandon, who's this young, innocent girl, and he says, what do you think of him? And Susan Sarandon says, oh, I don't like men with too many muscles, and, and Frankenfurter says, well, I didn't make him for you. So uh, we had been talking about this vis-a-vis -vis my characters, that my characters often get abused on the internet on sites like Goodreads. They're not likable, they're not nice, I don't, you know, I, I wouldn't be friends with her. And I always think of this line, well, I didn't make him for you, or I didn't make her for you. But I did make the novels for you. I mean, I don't write for myself. I, I mean, I, I consider myself profoundly lucky to have anybody pick up a book of mine and want to commit to reading this many pages. It, it's, it means more to me than I can say. But as far as the characters, I, I mean, I don't have this sense of obligation to provide every reader with the man of their dreams <laughs> or the best <laughs> friend they never had. I mean, uh, with the literature could do that, but we just, I just can't do that. So. Anyway, um, maybe one more, because I want to re read this very quick thing. Was there, did you have one? No, 
Okay. Um, so many people asked me what it was like to go through college admissions with my my elder of my two children. That I I wrote this I wrote this essay about it and. Uh, Oh my God, it was awful. It was really, really awful. Okay, so, but I want to thank you all for coming and listening to me, and I really appreciate it. Um, four years ago, when my novel admission was published, I somehow became an apologist for the admissions practices of selective American colleges. My protagonist, Portia Nathan, an admissions officer at Princeton, is moral to a fault, hardworking, and endlessly sympathetic to the plight of the applicant. But my readers, especially those whose kids had been rejected by their first choice colleges, were not sympathetic. Is it fair, I was asked repeatedly, as if fairness was what they really cared about, as if those crushing rejections their kids had received or might receive meant nothing so long as the process was fair. To answer, I mainly quoted Portia. How can you truly compare a kid who's been taken to theater and art museums or out of the country to a kid who's had to come up with the idea of going to college on his own? Morally, the whole thing's an obstacle course. What innocent times those were. Back then, as I signed those brand new hardcover copies of admission, I was the mother of a bright, interesting high school junior at the beginning of her college search. What vistas of possibility lay before her? City schools, country schools, big or small, near or far? Brochures and please apply letters arrived in the mail every day. Clearly the colleges of America were wild to meet my wonderful child who was on the dean's list at her highly competitive prep school, directing Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, and running the social life of the campus as vice president of her class. I mean, probably she wouldn't get in everywhere. No one gets in everywhere. Besides, all that mattered was that she get into one place, the right place. I love it, my daughter texted me from a college visit a few months later. The school in question was known for smart kids of a certain bohemian subtype and a reputation for perfuming Central Connecticut with cannabis, but never mind that. <laughs> also, the college claimed to look beyond GPAs and SAT scores to the whole applicant and professed a love of students who were quirky and unconventional. My daughter was quirky and unconventional. My daughter was so much more than her GPA and SAT score. <coughs> Clearly, it was a match. She had done the legwork, the research. All that remained was to knock at the door and be admitted. I shall not name this institution. I'm just going to call it overrated you. Why? Because it makes me feel better. That's why. <laughs> Reader, they rejected her. I know. How could they? How dare they? No cigar, she texted me seconds after finding out, and I had to pull my car over to the side of the road. I was shaking with disbelief and outrage. The reason? Passed down from the admissions office to her guidance counselor? GPA and SAT score. Bite me, overrated you. <laughs> Forget a woman scorned. Hell hath no fury like the mother of a college applicant who has been rejected. Rejected. I was this mother now. In fact, I had become just like the parents I had made fun of in my novel. Self-deluded people thunderstruck that admissions officers have failed to recognize the genius of their progeny. A millennial parent, in other words, as described in admission. Millennial parents were baby boomers and had always enjoyed the generational perk of being part of a big, big crowd. Now their offspring had a bubble of their own, and for once, bigger wasn't better. These parents had never been so out of control as they were now, watching their carefully nurtured children discover that they were the camel and Ivy League admissions offices the eye of the corresponding needle. Nothing could be done to make them all fit through. My daughter was great. She pulled herself together and fell in love again. This time, the object of her affections was a venerable school in upstate New York, once a college for women, now admitting students of all genders. It had been one of my own safety schools when I applied to college in the 1970s, but hey, as I wrote in admission, schools we might have considered undistinguished a generation ago are now statistically harder to get into than Harvard was when we were applying. Our kids should feel proud to get into any college today, not just the vaunted few. My daughter applied to this institution, which shall hereafter be known as not really that great college <laughs> during the early decision two period. Not really that great college? Bite me. <laughs> which is how, despite her effort, her care, and her genuine attachment to two colleges, to which needless to say, she would have lent her many talents, my daughter found herself scrambling to complete a raft of regular decision applications. Desperation, like gangrene, had set in. Were 10 applications enough? 14? 16? What if the unthinkable happened and every single one of these rejected her? Maybe 18 colleges, just to be sure. But you couldn't be sure. That was the point. For the first time, I found myself truly empathizing with those parents I had moralized about. 
Why hadn't I understood how painful this was, offering up your child to heartless, rigid bureaucrats? Why had I been so glib about parental pride? What was wrong with wanting the best for your kid? Despite my first-hand experiences in college admissions, the many books I'd read, the deans of admission I'd interviewed, and the 400-page novel I had recently written on the subject, I was a mess. As with advanced pregnancy, however, there is no cure for having your child apply to college except the delivery of the baby. Frankly, it amuses me that so many treatments for this condition are on offer, and by a vast industry of application aids, summer expedition companies, standardized test prep companies, and private counselors, while the only thing that might truly help the millennial parent of a college applicant has been ignored. Allow me to rectify this situation right now. Do you want to survive the trauma of watching your precious child apply to college? Then tank up your meds. <laughs> Better yet, some enterprising pharmaceutical company should pioneer special drug protocols for parents of high school seniors to begin in the spring of junior year, ramp up during senior fall, peak on April 1st, and taper down by graduation. By the time it was all over and the smoke had cleared, my daughter had some very nice options. And while I continued to obsess about a couple of these options, she made up her mind. I knew the minute I got in, she later informed me, I just didn't tell you. She did, however, tell me that my stress had made the whole thing far more gruesome for her than necessary. <laughs> well, I certainly deserved that. So is it fair? This crazy system in which every applicant is convinced they are at a disadvantage and someone else has an undeserved inside track? Well, sort of. It's fair-ish, at least if you control for life, which as everyone knows isn't fair and never has been. Or to quote Portia Nathan, fair is kind of an imprecise concept. Are admissions officers honest, hardworking, and faced with terrible decisions just as I wrote? Probably. But will I forever be resentful because my kid didn't get into the college of her choice? You betcha. <laughs> The film adaptation of admission opened in March. My daughter's a thriving undergraduate at NYU's Gallatin School and now believes that she would not have been happy at either of her two previous choices. And me, I no longer feel I have any authority on the subject of college admissions, none whatsoever. In fact, the sum total of my advice to other parents is to just get through it however you can. Even Portia Nathan comes undone when parenthood invades her life as an admissions officer. At the end of the day, she's no nobler than any other mother and neither is her creator. Thank you very much.